Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Daniel Hutchinson. I'm a professor in the history department here at Belmont Abbey College, and it's my pleasure today to welcome in conversation Lieutenant Colonel C.J. Zaworski from the U.S. Air Force. We're pleased to talk with him. He's an alum from the class of 2002, and we're looking forward to talk with him about his experiences as an Abbey alum and his experiences as a veteran of the U.S. Air Force. We're doing this to celebrate and to recognize the rich tradition of military veterans here in Abbey history. And it is my great pleasure to welcome CJ with us in conversation today. CJ, thanks for being here today. Well, Dan, I guess I should say, Dr. Hutchinson, I, I appreciate you uh, having me, my friend. And uh, I'm actually retired. So uh, from the Air Force, that's in the rear view, which is why I have a a beard like you, um, so no one mistakes me as breaking the breaking the military standards there. But uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely, CJ. Thank you, thank you for being here. Um, so, um, one of the things we wanted to sort of communicate to sort of the broader Abbey community is the stories of remarkable um, Abbey alums and the experiences they had as students and um, after the Abbey. And I guess one maybe good way to start that story is to share with us a little bit. What brought you to the Abbey? Where was home for you originally? And what brought you to this part of the world to study? Man, I tell you, um, it's it's not that uh, funny of a story or fun of a story. I In high school, I, I was a pretty good high school kid. Uh, I was probably a better kid in high school than I was in college. But uh, Abbey Plastic probably got that out of me by the time I got done. But, uh, you know, I didn't know where I wanted to go to school, quite frankly. Um, we were a, a, a faithful Catholic family. and But I wasn't really thinking about college, honestly. And, one morning around breakfast on a weekend, I think my, my mother felt like, hey, you need to figure this out. You need to get out of the house kind of thing. And I don't know where she got it, but she had a uh, she had a Belmont Abbey pamphlet that she dropped in my lap at like the dining room table. And on the front, there was a picture of a, of a, of a monk and a student walking down Abbey Road. And I was appalled. I was like, Mom, I do not want to be a priest. What are you doing? What are you talking about? I was like, this is crazy. Well, it didn't end up being a... Um, they used to have that Abbey Experience recruiting trip. I don't know if you remember that, if they still do it or not. But at the time, um, they had a weekend coming up, and um, it involves you know spending some time up there, spending a couple nights. Um, they took us up to Boone. We went to Sugar or um, Beach or whatever it's called, and and so um, she kind of forced me to go. And but I took a buddy of mine, so it was a little freedom. We got on the road. I'm from South Metro Atlanta, so it was about a four hour drive. And uh, we got up there, and you probably remember some of these guys. We ended up being over in O'Connell with um, Liam Farrell and uh, <laughs> Mike Casadia and these guys. And um, we had a blast. We had a blast. Uh, I have been to play soccer at the time, too, but I hadn't thought about playing soccer at school. And, and uh, they got me connected with the soccer team as well as Coach Paul Stoshman at the time. And uh, he said, listen, we already got our – our team, you know, I don't have any scholarship money for you, but you're more than welcome to come walk on. And you know, anyway, we, we had a blast. Uh, thought that, you know, Liam and those guys were the coolest guys ever. And they showed that they were just so uh, hospitable. And it just seemed like a really unique place. And uh, for whatever reason, it stuck with me. And that was, that was, that was, that was history. You know, that was it. So not nothing crazy, nothing. It just happened by the grace of God, I guess, in retrospect. Um, so you can't yeah. argue with that. Uh, yeah. I'm glad the Benedictine hospitality worked and the hospitality of uh, those great guys uh, worked as well. And yeah. So you arrived here fall 1998. Does that sound right? Yep. Same yeah. as you. Does that sound right? Yeah. It was yeah. me. Same as me, man. Yeah. Yeah. Quite, uh, quite a journey. Um, is so O'Connell still there or has it been condemned yet? <laughs> no, it is still <laughs> Very actively used <laughs> as, as is Paleth and RA. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. there's a bunch of new dorms. There's a bunch I, of I've, I've seen those. They're, they're amazing looking. Yeah. Yeah. It's, amazing. It's crazy. And the size of the student body has expanded dramatically since we were here. Yeah. So it's a happening place. Um, I love it. I love it. And we just got uh, the new hospital opened up as well. So remarkable, remarkable changes for sure. Um, so as your time as a student here, what what did you study? You, I know you were in the soccer team and you were captain of the soccer team by the end of your career, correct? Um, well, anyway, tell us a little bit about your experience as a student here at the Abbey, organizations you're a part of or activities or particular things that stood out to you as a student. You know, I think um, 
I got to admit, I mean, you know, you look back 22 years ago. First thing, if I saw myself or met myself 22 years ago, I would I would shake me uh, into some sense because I was a knucklehead for sure. You know, um, but um, certainly you grow as a person. Right. But um, I was a political science uh, major, um, played soccer, you know, during the fall season. We were pretty busy with it during the fall semester. We were very busy with that. Uh, between practice and, and and games. And I was actually just telling my one of my daughters who was complaining about, she had a school extracurricular event and the teacher the next day was still making them take a test. I said, listen, it's going to be that way. I, there are a couple of professors there uh, who will remain unnamed that, you know, th there was no mercy. Hey, I understand you were on the road last night. You, we still have a paper due tomorrow. Those things, you know, so, um, uh, you know, so in the poli side department, I got the, uh, I was blessed to be able to learn from um, Dr. Thewitt. So, so frequently, he was such a um, gifted instructor, um, and he, I, just, I just really looked up to him. I, I wish I, I valued it more then than I do now, because I know the way he teaches, and probably you teach, and probably Dr. Wasaki teach, it is similar to him. And, you know, um, that's, that's not as common as it should be, I don't think. So I was grateful to have him throughout, although he was tough. He gave me, he was no mercy, but uh, so poli sci played soccer. I was fortunate enough the last couple of years to be a captain. Me and Josh Franz, also a friend, I think both of us. And uh, um, that was a good experience. I think the soccer team was good to kind of keep me somewhat disciplined, you know. <laughs> uh, Coach Paul Stahlschmidt was kind of like my my dad away from home because he was a firm guy as well. I needed that. And he was he definitely held us to a high standard and uh, worked us hard. You know, also not as common today. So I appreciate it more now than I did then, but, uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I, don't be too hard on yourself when you're 18. What do you know? Right. You think you know it all, but. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it yeah, takes a minute. For sure. It yeah. takes a minute. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you had such a great experience on the men's soccer team, real great sense of community with you guys and, and great play and great, great teamwork. And yeah, Dr. Thewitt is an instructor in the honors uh, college, which I know you, that you were a part of. Yeah, he said definitely sets the bar high for the rest of us. And um, in fact, at homecoming this year, they dedicated a classroom to him in his honor. So there's a nice plaque there for. It's fantastic. For, yeah, yeah, and yeah, we're trying we're trying our best to sort of follow in the footsteps of these giants who came before. Yeah. Um, were there other figures here on campus, maybe within uh, the faculty or the monastic community, that were important to you during your time here as a as a student? I mean, I would, I would absolutely say Abbott Placid was, you know, Abbott Placid is, you know, before we had, before the Abbey had a long serving president and Dr. Theofeldler, you know, he was both, he did everything. He, he wore every hat and he was tireless. You and I talked about this earlier. Um, just such a stoic, holy person, uh, but also a, a human being that you can approach. It doesn't seem like it at first, but when it gets down to it, you can. And, you know, I think my relationship with him grew towards the end of my time there. Um, because I did come, get into a little trouble here. He helped me out. Um, but the, the the cool story about that is, you know, he ended up being um, my my middle daughter's godfather. Um, and then he married Katie and I. Um, he's come out to visit us in Omaha from time to time. Just never would have seen that happening then. Um, but certainly I remember Father John. We weren't as close. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you're, what you're hearing from me is I look back is the accountability, the the healthy accountability that that I was fortunate enough to receive at Belmont Abbey via um, the athletic program, via very difficult instructors, and then um, folks that just had high expectations of you. And you know, I remember I had my little honors uh, undergrad kind of thesis we had to do, and and uh, my presentation, I just I just kind of phoned it in. It wasn't my best work, and uh, rather than okay, hey, good job, get out of here, Father John, let me know, hey, that wasn't your best work, right? And I actually happened to be the class president um, and I had to give that, um, I had to give a little speech at our graduation. And I, Father, when Father John told me that, it honestly broke my heart because you don't want to disappoint those guys, right? And so I did everything I could to make that good and to give them, you know, some praise and thank you and honor and everything. And afterwards he came back, he came over and told me I had to redeem myself. So I was like, oh, fantastic. But, uh, you know, just you don't appreciate those things as much then I certain I, those things have stuck with me my whole life I've, I've I've relayed these stories to people my cadets my airmen whatever you know that you know 
accountability, you know, um, critical feedback is not a negative thing, you know, if it's done because they care about you getting better. And they did. Maybe I, I didn't know it then, but they did. And uh, it just has really stuck with me. So, yeah, you got to have that accountability if you're going to have growth, right? You've got to, yeah. if you want to move to the next level, you need those people in your life who are guiding you along the way, but also letting you know where, <laughs> where there's room for improvement. And uh, Father John, oh my goodness, he you're yeah. absolutely right. Not a guy you wanted to disappoint and had high standards. Yeah, oh, remarkable figure, remarkable figure. Remember him sitting on the uh, up there on the ledge in the in the gym for the basketball games. Father John, how tall was he anyway? Like, was he taller than you? Uh, he it felt like he was like seven yeah. foot tall. Like you know, yeah. with the, the 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 robes helped. Um, yeah, yeah, I think he was six five. Uh, and yeah, he loved guy. loved basketball. He loved supporting our Abbey teams and. Yeah, uh, a giant to be sure, and mm. uh, we've got a scholarship program named after him today for for theater, which um, he was a big. That's fan. awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. So you yeah. mentioned Katie, another important figure during your Abbey experience. You talk a little yeah. bit about, about uh, how that chapter of your life continues to shape uh, shape your experience now. You know, Dan, another fortunate event that I'm probably not worthy of, uh, even against my my attempts to not had this happen in my life. Uh, you know, I was a seat, we were seniors when Katie's class came in as freshmen and, um, you know, I knew that she was from, from Metro Atlanta. And so we mm -hmm. had that in common, but you know, we never, we never really hung out too much. I, I just knew I thought she was very pretty and these things. And I thought she was cool and funny, but we just weren't in the same, we just didn't hang out too much, but, um, um, we reconnected over time. Uh, and then if a homecoming, I was already in the air force at this point, I was living in Omaha and I came back for a homecoming and we, I came back. I was actually dating a girl at the time, um, pretty seriously, one of my sister's friends. And um, th once again, this is not something I'm proud of, but I'm thankful for. But came to homecoming and, um, you know, met up with, I think I stayed with, with our friend, our mutual friend, Ryan, and did all the things, Tiber Creek and, had all, you know, at the, at the school in the field, had a, had a blast. And, and but ended up reconnecting with, with Katie. And I mean, we just had a blast that weekend. And I, I'll be honest, I went. I went back, I had to go back to Omaha and go back to work. I'm like, I, I know who I want to be with. And so I, I'm just so thankful for that. And we ended up, I ended up proposing to her um, at, during a homecoming weekend in 2006. And we got married in 2007. Uh, we've been married for 17 years. Um, we have three daughters, 10, 13, and 15. And, you know, the Abby's just so special to us still. And so we wish we could be there more than we can be. Yeah. So that's wonderful. A, a really great example of, how the Abbey time again brings people together. Uh, I know, I know. It, yeah, um, I overplanted my coverage again. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I'm well aware of that. So. Well, Katie, Katie's a lucky woman. Katie's a lucky. Oh, woman. easy, easy. She's a good lady. She's actually <laughs> texting me right now. I was like, I'm talking to Dan. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. So you graduated in 2002, um, and I remember that our senior year, you know, uh, September 11, 2001, shaped a lot of people from our class in terms of, you know, their goals, their future trajectories, what sort of public service might have meant to them. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your road to the Air Force? Like, um, what, you know, what sort of inspired you to uh, join up and, and have this the start of this remarkable career? Yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if my career's been remarkable, but it's been it's been unique, and uh, I'm happy to share my own little story. Like we all have our, our our journey, but yeah, I mean, I remember that morning. We were we both lived in um in the apartments on campus, and I think we were all huddled around the TV at the time. It was pretty pretty uh, shocking, and I think our our senior gift to the school was that there's a um a big placard in the and it was in the in the um, dining area or whatever, but um. You know, when, when it came time to graduate, I, I had had an internship with a, with a senator in, in Charlotte, um, and I actually had a job working for the Democrat Party as a campaign manager in Mecklenburg and Gaston County. I don't know if you ever knew this or not, um, which I had no business doing, having zero experience, you know, managing campaigns in those huge counties. And I went out to Raleigh-Durham for training, and there's, you know, 12 of us out there from the state. And um, it was three, four days of training. And I realized that, hey, man, I, I was kind of naive to politics, really. You know, I was in political science because I liked it. I enjoyed the topic. Um, I, law, I, I didn't have the, quite the intellectual gifts to be a law student. I learned that quick. Um, but, OK, we can do this. And 
but I got out there and realized this was not a value system that that I um, believed in. And so I I wrote my little resignation letter on the flight on the way home, and that was that. So so now I'm left with no job, really. And so um, you know, I happened to to come across an Air Force officer recruiter in downtown Charlotte, and um, I gave him a little resume and a, and a cover letter. Right, what? What does our resume say? If, you know, at 22 years old, but there was nonetheless. And I said, "Do you have a degree?" I said, "I'll have one in a few weeks. We're graduating in a few weeks." And and um, well, he called me the next morning, like 8 a.m. And that's too early to get a call, you know, <laughs> when you're second semester senior, you know, living in the back of the third. He said, "Hey, listen, I got you on the schedule to come up and test up in uh, Asheville. They had a little recruiting station up there. You got to take a test to qualify. All right, come up here next. You come up, come up next Saturday or something like that." Well, sure as heck, um, the guys upstairs had a big party the, the Friday night before. And, uh, you know, I don't think I was involved per se, but I, I was trying to sleep, didn't get to sleep. I get another call. I missed. I slept right through the test. And so I get a call from the Air Force um, technical sergeant and chewing me out. Hey, where are you? You know, and he's going to give you one more chance. And by the grace of God, again, I got another chance. And so I was able to test and qualify. And I really just thought it was interesting. Uh, my dad is retired army. And so I figured, okay, this is something to explore and it worked out. And then I just had to really wait to go. And then I learned more. My dad had deployed to desert storm and early parts of Iraqi freedom at the time. And I never really thought I'd go into military, but I always had an appreciation for it. And so I can't say I just did it because of the, um, there's a lot of patriotic, you know, fervor at the time, which is good, but um, it's something that fit with, with who I was. It's funny going back to Dr. Through it. On, he wrote me a letter of recommendation for to be an officer, right? I had a, you had to get three of these things. He was one of them. And you know how he writes, you know how he talks, you can hear him. Something along, I still have it somewhere in my records, but it says something like, uh, CJ is uh, not necessarily, necessarily a man of, of intellect, but rather one of action. <laughs> a career in the Air Force will suit him well. <laughs> Which, you know what? But that was honest, critical you know, he's, he's just telling the truth, you know? And so, um, so anyway, so, uh, yeah, so I had a chance to go to officer training school in Maxwell Air Force Base. I was able to classify as a navigator. Um, and then from there, you know, started training and things like that. But I had to wait a couple months to do that. So, uh, yeah. Okay. That's um, cool. During your, your time in the Air Force, um, I don't know, you had a lot of different experiences, a lot of different opportunities and positions during your career. Um, looking back on that, were any of the experiences that you had at the Abbey helpful or instructive in helping you navigate the, you know, pretty, pretty complex and challenging career in in military? Any any dynamics from your experiences at the Abbey help you in that journey? I think, you know, it's funny in the Air Force, the this is gonna sound really strange. I ended up saying a lot more as my, as my career went on. So in the Air Force, they have core values there. It's integrity first, service before self, and excellence all we do, right? Each branch has some set of core values. The Army has a ton of words. Uh, but you know, you talk to your airmen or your cadets over time and you realize that some people, depending on their background, these are not these are these are not common concepts to everyone you come across, right? Depending on where people come from. Maybe it's a broken family. So that's why they have these things. But, you know, growing up, my I was aware of those concepts in my family. I became more familiar with them based on my liberal arts background, you know, um, reading the, the, the classics and, and you know, the, the Plato's Republic and these things, right? You talk about the definition of justice and these things, right? The Air Force didn't invent honesty or working hard or trying your best, right? But so not that I... Not that I uh, did all those things while I was a college kid, right? But I knew that those were the right things to do, and so that those are those were reinforced and reaffirmed, and so it wasn't difficult to adhere to those kind of standards when I got there. It was a different different environment, but it wasn't as difficult to transition as it could be. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that's fantastic to hear. Um, were there any particular? Um, assignments or opportunities during your your career that stand out in retrospect as particularly exciting or adventurous or that you found particularly maybe uh that you look back on with greater appreciation now looking back in hindsight sure i mean 
the job afforded me some, I, I'm not idealistic about it, but it afforded me some great um, adventures really and some travel abroad. Uh, early on in the first half of my career, I got to spend it flying, you know, on a big reconnaissance aircraft. And especially before I had a family, you know, it was a huge sense of adventure, right? There was nothing really tying you anywhere and you just went where you needed to go. And you had a bunch of good buddies on your air crew and that, that, that sense of camaraderie, and it's just like a sports team or anything. It's the same thing. You know, you, you're pursuing a certain mission and that was goodness. Right. And then, you know, then you transition to a new, new chapter in your life where you have family and there's other concerns. Right. Um, we did have the opportunity as a family to go to Qatar for two years, Doha, Qatar. And, you know, uh, my youngest was three and four, three, four at the time. And so they were young, but we had a black, we were there for two years and, they would have never been able to experience that. While we were there, we got to go to South Africa, Finland, Sri Lanka, Europe, all these things. So now my kids think we need to be going there every summer, which <laughs> I can't, right? But so that was an amazing experience. I mean, there's, there's several assignments, but these are ones that stick out. And then then uh, at the, towards the end of my career, um, I got to be an Air Force ROTC commander at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And um <clears throat> Didn't know what to expect. You know, I was in academia for, for three years. Uh, I was a professor of aerospace studies. Katie laughed at me for that. Um, but, you know, you go in with a, with an idea, you know, better now because you've worked with young people, you know, uh, young adults now. But, um, you know, they get a bad rap sometimes and sometimes for good reason. But what I learned was there's a lot of great ones out there that do want to serve and they work really hard. They're very goal oriented. They're very gifted. And um, so that was a very good bookend to my career. Like, so being able to, to, to pass on my experience, my, the same, the same things I learned at Belmont Abbey, you know, I, I brought to my classroom too. There's stuff you got to teach for the training objectives, the teaching objectives, right. But we can have a conversation about life in the world too, you know, so. Absolutely. Um, were there moments when you had to, when you were separated from you and your family, did you have any sort of assignments or deployments that might've, you know, been, yeah. been a challenge in terms of, you know, personal sacrifice? Yeah, you know, the um, <clears throat> I'll be honest with you, as time went on, the more and more homesick I would get, especially with the family. Yeah. And I remember the, the worst the, when it hit me. And that's one of the reasons I finally was ready to kind of, you know, let's go ahead and transition on out. You know, um, I had to go to um, Kandahar, Afghanistan one time and um, Hannah Grace was two and Haley was about two months old. And I, I had deployed several times and, and Katie and I had a great routine, right? It was no, it wasn't a big deal. We, we did it. There's no, it's part of the job, right? Not a big deal. A lot of people travel for work. And, but this time, man, I just remember thinking, man, this is really heavy. And it was really emotional for me. And, you know, more than just like the safety thing, I was like, man, is this, is this little girl going to remember me when I get back? Right. And she did. She absolutely did. You know, she remembered, <laughs> I remember it vividly. She started walking about three days after I get back, you know, she waited on me. Think, and that was pretty cool, but, <laughs> but just things like that. And so um, that was, that, those were challenging sometimes. Those were, those were challenges sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. For sure. But, but enriching in a way too, that, I mean, I will tell you, Dan, you know, there, you, so many, it's hard to really understand how good we have it here until you go somewhere that, where they don't have it, you know? And it's almost like I wish people could do some sort of service, maybe not military, maybe Peace Corps, maybe mission work, whatever, go abroad and, you know, see, hey man, you know what? They're, they're actually are kind of slaves some places or, hey, women don't actually get to vote, talk, drive, whatever, you know? So um, you can't just go to the store and get a, a T-bone steak or you can't drink clean water, you know, those things. I mean, we think about it, we know that, but it's hard to really put in to, to qualify until you've experienced it and you come back like, oh my gosh, this is worth worth protecting and, and, and safeguarding. Absolutely. Yeah. So that sounds like some good advice for uh, the Abbey student of today. Get out, see the world, serve. Absolutely. Yeah. Get, get Gain an appreciation for both what we have, what's worth fighting for, and uh, a sense of what, what other folks are experiencing. And different cultural perspectives too. You know, I mean, I'll say this, my, my father-in-law, he's a great man. I love him dearly, but I took his daughter over there and his granddaughters to, to the Middle East. And at one point he called me, he's like, Hey, are you bringing your pistol? You know, I'm like, no, I can't bring my pistol. What's wrong with you? I can't bring a gun with me to a foreign land, you know, unless it's like my military issue stuff. And he's like, Oh, I thought everybody out there was, was carrying a, you know, machine gun. I'm like, no, Doha has the nicest airport in the world. For example, you know, it's, you don't, we love, the food is amazing. And, and the people there, 
Um, they love the kids because, you know, I think Hope had lighter hair at the time. So they're like, you know, tossing her hair and just, just things like that, you know, you just don't know until you've experienced it. So you're absolutely right. It, it's worth experiencing in some sort of way, whether it's travel, service, whatever, you know, do it while you can. You just kind of get a better perspective. Yeah. Heck yeah. Um, other advice that you might give, you know, imagine talking to maybe not 18 year old us's, but you know, if you, <laughs> you know, thinking back um, upon the experiences that you've had, and if you were advising students today, any sort of advice you might give them as they are experiencing their time here at the Abbey or thinking about what's down the road? Yeah, that, I know that I, I thought that might be a question, right? I thought that might be a question. Um, even my daughter right now, is she's 15. She's very goal oriented. She's um, she wants to know what the next step is. And <clears throat> I think we all do to a degree. Hey, what is our literally what is our degree going to be? What do we want to do? What are you going to be when you grow up? People still ask me that. Like, I have no idea. I've been I've lucked into so many of these things. And uh, I think I think the idea is that, you know, goals are good. A plan is good. It doesn't always work out how you want it to be. But hey, if you get an 80 percent plan, go with it. Right. Don't wait till you have a 100 percent plan. And if there's a change, a bump in the road, it's probably meant to be because, you know, ultimately it's going to be the Lord's will. And it's hard to remember, especially as a young person. Um, it was very difficult for me as a, as a military person because I always wanted to have a plan. I always wanted to have the information. I always wanted to know what, when. Um, but that's not something we get, you know. So if you trust your instincts, if you have a, if you have something in your heart that you think you want to do, it's you, Someone's probably the God, God is probably trying to tell you something. Hey, man, you need to explore this potentially. So um, I guess that's something like that. I, um, everyone's everyone's journey is so different. You know, I look at all of our counterparts in school and where they're at now and their successes and their families and you there as a professor, you and Joe. It's like, man, it's amazing to see. And I think back to where we were in school. I mean, who knew where we would all be now, you know, what we'd be doing. So no, it's pretty astonishing. You're right. Um, we didn't, I don't know that we knew, you know, for sure. No, yeah. no, it is, uh, it is sort of astonishing. Like you said, uh, coming across alums, learning about the remarkable lives they've led, the successes they've had, the families they had. And, you know, I remember us as 18 year olds, knuckleheads, an accurate and term for, I don't know about you, but certainly for me. Absolutely. Um, me. Yeah, absolutely. It, yeah. It, it, it's a remarkable story. Um, so tell us a little about um, your world today. You're, uh, you're you're retired from the from the Air Force. Where where do you call home now, and yeah. what is maybe the next step in your journey? Yeah, you know, I, I on October first, I retired from the Air Force. I, I say retired loosely because I'm obviously not going to retire. I have kids and things to do. I'm pretty young, but um, October first, I retired after a little less than 22 years in the Air Force, and we're we're going to stay put here in uh, Montgomery, Alabama. We live out in Pike Road, Alabama, but um, my, my wife works at a school called Montgomery Catholic Prep. I think some of their folks have visited the Abbey trying to recruit good teachers and things like this. Uh, my girls are, are we're fortunate enough to send my girls there. So really life like you probably expect is, you know, uh, my, one of my daughters is a cheerleader. One of them is in the band and color guard. The other one is plays volleyball and, and, and basketball. So, you know, it's from it's on to, from one season to the next and uh, um we, we live close enough to family now too. So we enjoy getting to see them from time to time. Um, you know, my mother and father-in-law just making a quick trip for a night this weekend to come say, Hey to everybody. Great. Come on by. Um, if nothing special, just living life, you know, and I feel like we're very blessed. Uh, I'm working with a, um, like I said, I'm working for Cadell construction. Um, and I have, I don't have a construction background, but they valued my operations and, and leadership background. And so I really appreciate them giving me that opportunity mm -hmm. and I'm learning a ton in a new industry. And to be honest with you, um, it's pretty different being cool. It's pretty cool being in a private sector or whatever you call it. I, I'd love to have it. the beard's awesome. It's fun, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> well, I know, I know that you're, you're, you're killing it and it's a good, uh, I'm sure a new adventure for sure. And, um, learning some new tricks and I know it, I'm sure it's very nice to be home every night with the kids to see them yeah. get bigger, get in, get into mischief. And then yeah. figure out, uh, you know, the next stage for them. Um, have them visit the Abbey and when they're when it's time. Yeah, we're hey, we're working on, we're working on. You know, my my oldest wants to go to Notre Dame. I was like, I understand, I did too at one point. You know, good luck with that. <laughs> we'll support that, but there's a little private Catholic school a little bit closer if you want to look into it. So, we're working right. on them, working on. Them. But they don't they don't want to be like mom and dad. You know, they want to make their own way. I understand, right? 
Yeah, I understand. And they'll figure it out like we figured it out. Somewhere. That's right. That's right. Well, Absolutely. CJ, I want to thank you for your time today and thank you, um, especially for your service and sharing with us a little bit about your experiences as a veteran, as an Abbey alum, and uh, and as a friend. I'm so glad to see all the great stuff that that you and Katie have been doing. And I'm uh, you know looking forward to seeing you back on campus sometime in the near future. Well, Dan, likewise, man, it was great to see you. And uh, please pass my best to anyone and everyone up there who will listen. Uh, definitely miss seeing you guys. I miss the Abbey. And uh, I look forward to reconnecting soon in the near future. Don't be a stranger.